The title of today's message is, Is Belief Enough? What does it mean to believe? In November of 1992, due to a series of events, I walked away from the things of God. I told my wife of the time that I was through with all things religious. No more prayer, no more Bible study, no more church. I was done. Now the mother of my children was a deeply religious former Catholic and she could not conceive of this as having any form of sanity. So she divorced me. That became a journey of what is called the dark night of the soul for me as I wandered through many experiences for almost 14 years. I was still somewhat in that place when I met and married Gracie. What I learned from everything of that time was that when I walked away, I thought I believed in God, but a crisis of faith was gaining the victory. When I came out of that dark place, I no longer questioned my belief in God. Belief became a solid rock in my life. Whereas before my belief could be easily shaken, easy is no longer an operative word for me in that realm. When the knowledge of our salvation is based on something that we were told to do, such as confess our sins or come down to the altar or to say that Jesus is Lord or ask Jesus into our hearts. If it's based on any of those things, then we will always be vulnerable to the attacks of doubt. Did I do it right? Was my repentance sincere enough? Did I go to the altar just because everyone else was going? These doubts can eventually wear you down to the point that you give up trying to believe as I did that late November night. Fortunately, though, John has a remedy for this as we read in his first letter. He tells us how we can know for sure that we have been born again. In chapter 5, in the first part of verse 1, he says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now, the word translated believes in is the verb form of the word faith. And most of us here, I believe, are familiar with the Bible definition of faith given in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of the things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I want you to notice the two words that are highlighted there, assurance and conviction. Assurance relates to, our, to former times in our country when all that was needed was for a person to give their word and a handshake that they would do something. People were assured that it would be done. They could take it to the bank, sometimes literally. If you told me I could buy your horse and we shook on it, I could go to the bank and tell them that I, you had given me your word and the bank would loan me the money. Sadly, those days are long gone. However, that does not negate the idea of assurance as contained in the verse. A living faith has an assurance that what has been spoken is true. A living faith will act on this assurance. An even stronger word in this is the word conviction. A person with a living faith has a conviction that even though there are things that cannot be seen, touched, or tasted, there is nonetheless the reality behind that conviction. A conviction is something we act on regardless of circumstances. A conviction is stronger than a preference. For instance, I almost have a conviction that Brussels sprouts were not created by God. However, on occasion, I've been known to eat one or two. 
Therefore, I only have a preference to avoid those little cabbages, not a conviction. A conviction will not allow you to do, say, look, or participate in any way with something that goes against that conviction. When your faith, your belief, becomes a conviction, then the seasons of doubt become much fewer with much less power. So John begins this section of his letter telling us that if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, then we have been born of God, or in our Christianese, born again. He then begins to develop this thought to show how faith in God is much more than just a simple declaration. John tells us that a living faith will manifest itself in our daily life. The first thing, and the most important for John, is the idea and application of love. The rest of the complete John 5, 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. The reading this morning from the Revised Standard says, whoever loves the parent loves the siblings. It's not the way it read, but that's what it says. If you have been born of God, then you love the Father. In John's thinking, love of the birth parent is a given. It's just automatic. And if you love God, then it is also a given that you love others who have also been born of God. They're called your brothers and sisters. However, you may not be sure that your love is adequate or intense enough. <clears throat> that could lead you to doubt. If you have been truly born of God, you can begin to doubt your salvation even in the idea of love. Do I really love them? What does it mean to love? Maybe I just like them. Or maybe the fact that I don't like them, but I love them. Is that possible? So John continues with his explanation. In verse 2 we read, By this we know that we love the children of God, whom we love God, and obey his commandments. Now isn't that interesting? We know that we love the children of God not based on any fact or feeling of relationship with those oddballs we might call brothers and sisters. We know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Wow. Where's he getting this stuff? How can we know that we truly love the other children of God? He says, when we love God and obey his commandments. It's that simple. But you know where I go? Oh, man. There are just some of those commandments that are too much for me. I'm sure you cannot identify with that. There's no way I can ever turn the other cheek when someone attacks me because I believe I should stand for my rights. I'm supposed to fight back. I know you can probably come up with a commandment that you feel the same way, you just can't abide by it. It's too hard for you to keep. In that place, though, you may begin to wonder, based on this verse, if you truly love God. If you're not able to keep a commandment, do I really love God? And if you begin to doubt that, it is easy to begin to doubt whether you are truly born again or saved. It all flows together. But again, John does not leave us hanging on this one either. He says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. He tells us that if we want to know if we truly love God, then we look to how well we keep his commandments. And didn't Jesus say the same thing? In John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John tells us that Regardless of how we may feel about keeping all those commandments, those commandments are not burdensome. That's a tough one to swallow. That's hard to believe. If we think they are burdensome, then we have not understood, though, the truth of Scripture. When the disciples heard Jesus say to keep his commandments, I'm sure they all nodded in agreement. Yes, Master, that's... That makes sense. We should, we should keep the commandments. 
But I'm also sure that they had questions about such a requirement to prove their love. How many of you, either when with your proposal of marriage or your acceptance of the proposal, how many of you said, I will marry you on one condition? You've got to prove you love me by doing everything I tell you. Huh? Marriage wouldn't have happened, would it? No, not at all. We just make a simple promise to love the other. Quit glaring at him. We just do that. Do you realize that is all God is asking from us? He has already demonstrated his love for us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't even wait for us to accept his proposal. He just went overboard to prove his love for us. Then... God turned around and made the keeping of his commandments quite simple. We read a lesson given in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40, about a young man who questioned Jesus. And he said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. <clears throat> And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. When we understand this, what Jesus said here, we do not need to concern ourselves with all the different details of the Bible about what it means to be right or righteous. All those little details are simply explanations about what love looks like. Every one of the commands is a detail about what love is. Love is the greatest force in the world. It is that love of God which ultimately won our heart and brought us into the things of God. Yeah, you may think that you have done something to get yourself saved but the reality is that before we could understand it we were already persuaded by love and now that love has caused us to have a faith that is strong that carries us through our tough times and all of us have gone through tough times there are people in this congregation this morning who have been given every reason to turn their backs on God. Some of them testify, though, to at least turning sideways and looking at the Lord while they debated the purpose of what was happening in their lives, but faith overcame their doubts. That is what John then tells us as he finished up this section of his letter. In verse 4 we read, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? See how he's gone full circle. Belief in Jesus. He ties it all together here with these last two sentences. Our faith is what keeps us in victory lane, even after we feel like we've been knocked out of the race. Our faith is there because we have been born of God. He did it, not us. It is our faith which overcomes. Overcomes means to have the victory, to win. Nothing in this world can get you down when your faith is a conviction that you belong to the Father. So the opening question this morning was, is belief enough? And the answer is yes. Belief will power your life through the toughest of times while it also brings changes to the way that you do things. If you have struggled with doubt recently or any time in your past, I encourage you to take this passage from John's letter and read and meditate on these five verses. Let the truth of it filter through 
your fear and doubts filter all the way down to your heart and mind. And when you do, I promise loving others will take on new meaning and expression in your life. Amen.